So here we have the nitrogen cycle, and the corner that I really want to pull your attention to is the one over here where you can see nitrogen fixation taking place, of course catalyzed by things like the cyanobacteria. And then from there, we want to look at this right-hand corner, which is collectively called the nitrification process. And we can see ammonia getting converted into nitrite and eventually into nitrate. Now, nitrate enriches the soil, and and nitrate can be taken up by plants and utilized by plants as a source of nitrogen. So this is an important cornerstone of the nitrogen cycle. And let's talk first about the bacteria that take ammonia and convert it to nitrite, and then about the bacteria that take nitrite and convert it to nitrate. So a two-step process that's involved in all of nitrification. So two types of organisms, there are the ammonia oxidizers and the the nitrite oxidizers. So looking at both of those processes collectively taking orga uh, inorganic nitrogen and enriching the soil in this process of nitrification. So let's begin by looking at the ammonia oxidizers and how they can convert that NH3, um, it goes from NH3 to NH4 plus in an aqueous soil. That NH4 plus then can be converted into nitrite. Now Ammonia oxidizers such as nitrous ammonis are famous for doing this, and what we have to pull our attention to is that nitrite is toxic. So I know I know Steve likes to fish. I don't know if that means you also like fish and have a fish tank, but <laughs> if you happen to, um, and then you'll you'll you will have monitored the nitrite levels in your fish tank, and you'll know that nitrite is toxic. So if the nitrite levels climb too high, it can actually be deadly to many forms of life. And so we we can see if the balance is off between the ammonia oxidizers as versus the nitrite oxidizers, this can really wreak havoc with any sort of soil or aqueous environment. So the nitrite oxidizers are essential in then taking that nitrite and taking it a step further, oxidizing it all the way to nitrate. Nitrobacter and nitrococcus are good examples of nitrite oxidizers. Now, nitrate, we speak of it in sort of a... Um, wonderful terms of it being able to enrich the soil and be allow a form of nitrogen to be taken up by plant life. But we also have to realize that if excessive amounts of nitrate are found in the soil, this can be a huge problem. And if nitrates are leaking out of the soil and into lar in large quantities into the water supply, this can lead to something called blue baby syndrome. Those of you who are reading the Poland book, he mentions that. Um, it's actually competitive with binding at the oxygen binding site in hemoglobin and can literally affect ability to transport oxygen. And the saddest thing about this is that uh, a big reason that we see massive nitrate accumulation is over fertilization. And you guys have probably met somebody who's like, if a little fertilizer is good, then a lot of fertilizer must be even better, which is not true. And in fact, if you over fertilize, then that nitrate will leach into the soil and it can cause major impacts. And uh, for those of you who are really interested in this stuff, this can be a subject that you can take so far in terms of understanding environmental justice and in fact you should take a moment to look up where nitrate levels are the highest, that is what kind of people get the worst hit by these water pollution events and you'll find that most often it's in the most socio-economically depressed areas that the nitrate levels are the highest in the water, in the drinking water. So this is really can become an issue uh, in its own right. Let's look though a little bit at the nitrifiers and their diversity because they are a diverse group of gram negatives. They can have ellipsoidal shapes, spherical shapes, spirillar, they can be lobate. Um, they're often motile, often have peritrichous flagella. Remember that's the flagella all over the surface of the cell. I'll just grab my E. coli, remind you that peritrichous flagella, right, all over the surface of the cell. So we recognize that as being a way that they get around and maybe colonize certain of these areas 
areas that they're typical in, ranging from soil, as we just mentioned, to sewage disposal systems, freshwater, marine, uh, what have you. But one note is if there's excessive growth of the nitrifiers, maybe due to, again, lots of excessive nitrogen com contamination, then that can consume. Notice that these are all oxidation reactions, right? That's the gradual oxidation of a very reduced nitrogen form to a very oxidized nitrogen form. And so in that process, it consumes oxygen and it can quickly make a body of water become anoxic. And that can be problematic because then the balance within that water body may be off and you'll start to get growth of some of the other H2S producing, for example, organisms and maybe even eventually lead to kill zones in, the, in those areas. Okay, so that's one corner of the nitrogen cycle and one other organism that lives often in the top of the Winogradsky column. Let's now talk about other strategies to live in aqueous solution at the top of the Winogradsky. And one of the things that some of you saw on your Winogradsky slides were actually organisms that looked like cyanobacteria, but were actually another group of sheathed bacteria. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to show you the picture of Nitrobacter and Nitrosomonas, the ammonia oxidizer on the bottom and the nitrite oxidizer on the top. So now we can look at the sheathed bacteria. So these are belong to a, a class called Beta Proteobacteria Order Burk Burkholderialis. It's a hard one to pronounce, but the Burkholderialis are sheathed in a outer straw-like containment. This sheath is comprised of about 35% polysaccharide, about 25% polypeptide-ish, and it also includes some things like manganese oxides and iron oxides. And in fact, some of these sheathed bacteria play a role in cycling of elements that you maybe even didn't know there was a cycle for like manganese cycle. So they're pretty versatile in what they do for not just bacteria themselves, but for greater biogeochemical cycling. So if we look at how bacteria fit into an outer sheath, these can often be, I guess what you might say about them is that the sheath is sort of tight fitting and close fitting, but it's never constricting. It's like a good relationship, right? Um, so it's close fit fitting, but it's not tightly constricting. And that's generally what you'll see in this community of sheathed cells. Now, thinking about how this might allow organis to, uh, organisms to survive in an aqueous environment, what sort of benefits and perks it might give to these bacteria, one of which is simply to allow them to adhere to surfaces and to form a long community of cells that may literally flow in the, the water. So they can hold on and let nutrients pass them by while they stay adhered to a solid surface. That's a great advantage to these cells to be able to stay adhered and really move along with the water as it passes and in doing so grab the nutrients that pass by. But this is also a protective strategy as well. Imagine that the cells within the community inside of the sheath are much less apt to be um, subject to predation. So predators have a harder time getting through the sheath and getting to the bacteria within. So not only does it help bacteria to adhere to surfaces such as plants and rocks, but it also helps them to capture nutrients from running water as that running water goes by. It also helps protect them from predators and in a moment we're going to talk about one of the most quintessential predators called Della Vibrio that literally preys on gram-negative bacteria. So this Della Vibrio would be less likely to be able to get to a sheathed bacterium. A couple of genera that characterize the sheath bacteria, Spherotillus is one, and it's actually considered quite a nuisance because Spherotillus will get into wastewater systems and it will actually inhibit the ability of sewage sludge to settle. Remember how we talked about the first stage of treatment in the wastewater treatment plant is allowing the solids to settle out, and Spherotillus will often get in the way of that, but you know, it loves sitting around in in, in moving sewage sludge because it's capturing so many good organic nutrients from that passing by. So it's, it's getting a benefit, but it's considered a nuisance because it gets in the way of the settling process. Leptothrix is kind of famous for helping in the manganese cycle, certainly another good example genus within these, this group of largely um, gram-negative rods. So when these 
organisms that are sheathed want to reproduce, they will send off a swarmer daughter cell that is a motile daughter cell that will head out from the community, you know, flitter around and eventually find a place to adhere and begin the production of a whole new sheath. So these swarmer cells are what allow the, the formation of a whole new chain of sheathed bacterial cells. So kind of a cool way to exist and thrive and live within an aqueous environment, but certainly not the only way to do so. And the next group of organisms are maybe even cooler. They form a prosthesia, which really is like a long appendage from the cell that reaches out and attaches to some surface. So these prosthecate bacteria are pretty famous. They're alpha proteobacteria. They have these projections that increase surface area but also allow for adherence to certain solid surfaces. Colobacter is unarguably the most famous of the prosthecate bacteria and it is able to form a long prosthesia that attaches, sometimes it can be 10 times the length of the cell itself, and it attaches to surfaces. Sometimes the surfaces that it attaches to are, you know, things like inorganic, like particles, rock type particles, but sometimes the surface is living. And in fact, sometimes it can even get nutrients, maybe attaching to a larger amoeboid cell or something like that. So this stalk has at its end something called a holdfast, and the holdfast has the ability to stick on to that solid surface and we'll talk more about that in a moment. But I want to also bring your attention to the cool way in which these reproduce. So at the end, at one end of the cell, there's going to be sort of a almost budding off. It's called an asymmetric transverse binary fission. <laughs> I'm going to say that one more time. Asymmetric transverse binary fission. That's the way these reproduce. So they form this daughter cell at a polar end of the mother cell. And literally, it forms rings. Each time a mother cell forms a daughter cell, there'll be another ring on the mother cell. So you can literally see how many progeny cells it has had. So when it, f it forms this daughter cell, it's a swarmer cell. It's a motile, another swarmer cell like what we saw with the sheath bacteria. And it swims off and heads off to another solid surface. What's really cool is it swims around for about 30 to 40 minutes and then it finds this other surface creates in the place of the flagellum another holdfast and, and another prosthesia to adhere to another surface. So this whole process of asymmetric transverse binary fission takes about two hours and it involves that whole cycle of letting the new daughter swarmer cell free and then it goes off and finds its place to develop a holdfast and, and create another prosthesia. So pretty cool way of, of replicating. But maybe even more cool, let me show you this picture. It is it is one of my favorites. Where you can see the it's kind of flipped as compared to the picture we were just looking at. You can see the hold fast and the prosthesia here. Not very long in this particular picture, but you see the mother cell going undergoing asymmetric transverse binary fission and forming the daughter cell. And of course then we'll have a ring from where that takes took place, you see the flagellum on the swarmer daughter cell, and in that spot, eventually the holdfast will develop and allow that daughter cell to adhere to a new surface. But get this, what's really, really interesting is the strength of the glue that's formed by the holdfast. It turns out that this is literally nature's strongest glue. This Okay, I, I think Austin will appreciate this. This is how strong this glue is. If you took an F-250 pickup truck and you hung it from a one inch ceiling tile, that's how strong this is you know, capable of. So this glue is of quite an interest in industry. And it might interest Whitley to know that in fact, this is, is um, thought that it may have eventually some application in dentistry. And I don't know, I haven't looked lately as to whether they have some things patented that take advantage of the glue of Colobacter crescentis. 
So those of you who were craving a little violence in today's lecture, you've gotten your wish. <laughs> um, this is where things get a little bit, a little bit crazy as we look at this crazy present predator called Della Vibrio. Della Vibrio is literally a tiny gram negative kind of curved rod with a flagellum to, to take all flagella. It is an incredibly fast moving, incredibly long flagellum. It spins at a hundred revolutions per second, allowing the, the cell to move at 100 body lengths per second, and it's predaceous. So it literally takes off swimming and rotating its flagellum, and it rams into its prey. In fact, it rams into other gram-negative rods, hits them so hard that it literally moves them. And when it when it starts to hit, it bores in and it starts revolving and it starts boring into the cell wall and it lodges itself in the periplasmic space of a gram negative cell. And once inside of that gram negative cell, it begins to elongate, it loses its flagellum and it gets this really long, almost like worm like structure. And then it undergoes multiple fission where it just shatters into many daughter cells. And then those many daughter cells, of course, escape from the the prey cell and head off to in to prey on more cells. So this might kind of remind you of a virus. There is a difference though. It's a predator, not an obligate intracellular parasite. So while you ponder that, let's go ahead and write this down. A small gram negative aerobic curved rods that's highly, highly motile, 100 body lengths per second. It derives its nutrient by preying on things like E. coli. In the hunt and the kill, Della Vibrio swims along rapidly until it collides with its prey, literally moving its prey. It then attaches to the host, begins rotating while secreting enzymes. Now, let me just anticipate a question. I bet, I bet Caleb or Cody or somebody's raising their hand right now and saying, Rachel, how is it that it doesn't, that, that it doesn't cause damage to the cell itself? How does Della Vibrio stop from damaging itself? And it turns out it has a, um, resistant layer on the outside that resists the enzymes that it secretes to break down the cell wall of the host, but it doesn't hurt the Della Vibrio itself. So then it bores this hole into the cell wall of the prey cell and it lodges itself in the periplasmic space. It loses its flagellum, it elongates, forms this like worm-like structure, and then it undergoes multiple fission and it makes many more daughter cells so they can escape and prey on other cells. So as you're thinking about the similarities of this to bacteriophage, there are a lot of them. Of course, we did differentiate that this is a predator and not an obligate intracellular parasite. But on the other hand, you can literally isolate Della Vibrio in the same way that we isolated bacteriophage. Remember how we did an overlay technique and we looked for the plaques? Della Vibrios form plaques as well, so you could isolate them in the same way. And maybe one of you is thinking, I don't know, maybe Sophia is thinking, I wonder if Della Vibrio could be used in place of antibiotics. And in fact, many are thinking about that and they, they talk about it as possibly the next living antibiotic that you could use a bacterium to treat other bacteria, which uh, there's some issues with that, just like there is with bacterial phage therapy. But it's of note and certainly an interesting idea. Here's a great picture where you see the Della Vibrio life cycle as it bores into the host cell, spending about 10 minutes wedging itself in there and then growing longer, elongating and undergoing multiple fission as it chows down on that prey cell. We'll finish our coverage for today's lecture by talking about uh, some other potentially aquatic bacteria. They like to live in very highly viscous solutions. Some of them are also uh, are also parasitic cells. Some of them are also symbio symbiotic, so it depends upon the type that you're talking about. But these are our spirochetes. Yes, we've talked about them many times before because the ever famous treponema pallidum that causes syphilis is one of these. These are gram-negative spiral cells, very, very flexible, and they are um, they move as spirochetes do, so like a corkscrew, so they've got that kind of corkscrew motion going on. And that's made possible by a locomotion mechanism called an axial filament. And what happens with this is that the cell literally has two 
amphitrichous flagella, right, on either end of the, the, the cell. But these don't extend outside of the cell wall. Instead, they're encased inside, and that forces them to wrap back around on the cell itself. And in doing that, when they rotate, you can kind of picture how if they're trying to rotate, how we talked about them rotating like propellers, well as they try to rotate, it causes the cell to start moving like a, a corkscrew, right? So we can see how this axial filament leads to sort of weird kind of motion and really the, the sort of corkscrew motion. So these flagella that wrap back around and extend towards one another and lie inside of an outer sheath and thus rotation kind of makes that corkscrew motion. This is really what makes the spirochetes very, very unique. And there are some diverse, some diversity within the spirochetes. Uh, some genera are free living. Leptospira lives in muddy kind of sediment. Some are symbiotic. And in fact, um, I think it will interest uh, uh, Callie's group, Michael and Fonz, and all of you to think about the symbiosis that we see here in the hindguts of termites, especially after all your reading of about ants. So it's interesting though that most of the fixed nitrogen that a termite needs come f comes from its spirochete symbio symbionts. <laughs> then of course we have our, our parasites like Treponema pallidum and Borrelia burgdorf burgdorferi. Uh, that one's a hard one to pronounce, but that's the one that causes Lyme disease that we had talked about before. So some of them certainly are parasitic. Well that actually covers our overarching survey of the bacterial world and on Wednesday we're going to do a short survey of the proteas. We'll get to talk a little bit about algae and protozoa, so-called. We'll talk about that later. But if you guys would like, there is a, um, there's a, a nice crossword puzzle that helps to review some of the bacteria that we've covered all semester, but maybe you've never written down, like Campylobacter jejuni, my sister's watery diarrhea one, right? Uh, so if you'd like to engage in that crossword puzzle, maybe get get going on that. Um, that would be kind of fun, but, you know, not essential. So have a wonderful Monday, and I can't wait to see you all tomorrow for the practical exam.